and we're very proud this year to honor for the very first time a sports legend on our human rights walkway. Now, it's not often that people in professional sports or, or, or amateur sports rise to the status where they would be honored on a human rights walkway. But Jackie Robinson, who led in the fight to integrate the major leagues, and I'm sure Jack will talk to you a lot more today about his time with the Montreal Royals and the Brooklyn Dodgers and Branch Rickey and all of the things related to how Jackie Robinson integrated the major leagues. But, but he is someone who has a link to Montreal because he lived here and he loved it here and also changed sports, changed sports forever, made a start for equality in professional sports. And so for that reason, our council is very proud and we hope most of you on the 1st of July on Canada Day will join with us in Trudeau Park to inaugurate Jackie Robinson onto the Human Rights Walkway. So I want to congratulate the English Montreal School Board and all of the private Jewish day schools who are here for cooperating with the City of Cote St. Luke on this event. I want to thank Mike and Alan Levine as co-chairman of the event for putting it together. And I hope that you guys will leave here with a much more profound knowledge about Jackie Robinson, the man and the person and what all that he accomplished. So let me actually, uh, you know, come, I want to come at the Jackie Robinson story, not with the specifics of the story uh, per se, although I'll talk about one or two in terms of Jackie Robinson's uh, breakthrough and the role Montreal played, but I want to uh, share with you the starting point for me uh, in terms of the story and why I came to the story, because right? that is something that many people ask me, why would I, at the time I was working at the Cambridge Congress, uh, why did I come to this story? I came to this story in part because, as Anthony mentioned, it was a powerful human rights story, and as uh, someone representing the Canadian Jewish Congress and involved with a community that really values human rights, that puts a, a, a very high premium on human rights, for, for whom human rights is important, uh, sacrosanct. Um, uh, so, you know, that was an important element of it for me, but there was another element of the story that attracted me. Uh, and not so much attracted me, but raised a, a serious question in my mind. And it had to do with uh, what I learned uh, in high school, in my history courses, and I had wonderful history teachers, I had a really good chemistry teacher too in high school, right, who's with us today actually, and I don't want to be cautious about those things, I mentioned Alan Levine, my chemistry teacher. Um, and uh, in my history courses, I always uh, sort of, uh, was brought uh, around the, with the idea that the United States was a, a powerful country that I greatly respected, that I thought was the greatest democracy, fighting for freedom, uh, fighting for the liberty of uh, the, the free world, if you like. And you know, I still think the United States is a great country, that hasn't changed. But I, I confronted this really powerful dilemma, and that powerful dilemma is, why this great country that we associate really with fundamental freedom uh, that has currently one of the most amazing presidents, at least I think so, uh, you know, that, uh, one of the most amazing leaders internationally, uh, why is it that that country fighting against fascism, fighting against Nazism, was also practicing racial segregation. Right? And it was a serious question for me. I was a, a mind bender. Right? For my history courses, I just couldn't understand that. In fact, in part, to be fair, before I came to this story, uh, sort of, uh, I guess, 20 years after I finished high school, uh, I put that aside. I sort of said, well, wait a second. You know, I never really gave it enough thought, because I always was brought up in terms of my learning experience, not asking those questions, not thinking that through carefully, the United States was just this amazing country where people from all around the world came and settled and many achieved prosperity, you know, the uh, land of opportunity, and yet practicing segregation against its African descent community. Very big puzzle. How do we answer that? And to this day, I actually have a fair degree of difficulty answering that question. And in fact, you know, uh, Adolf Hitler, would sometimes look at the United States and say, hey, they're practicing racial segregation policies. I, I support those policies. That's fine. Uh, I'm not going to be taught lessons uh, by a country that practices those type of policies, which I endorse. So I had to really work my way through that problem. And that's where I felt motivated to pursue this story, try to better understand this story in that historic context. And I'm glad I can share that for you here today, because that's not usually what I talk about when I deal with the Jackie Robinson issue as a historian. But as you know, many of you here who are either 
taking history courses, will be taking them at some point in the future. Uh, those are things that you do need to think through because we need to be able to uh, work our way through some of these problems with critical thinking. Right? Critical thinking skills are just so important to learning uh, and learning history uh, and so that it's not boring, which some people feel it is, I don't as a historian, uh, requires that you build those critical thinking skills and you ask yourself these questions. Now, of course, the Second World War is an important period for me personally, for many people in the Jewish community, uh, because many of our relatives, family, or friends, and others uh, really suffered through that period. My mom was, uh, in fact, a, a concentration camp survivor. So that makes it even more challenging for me as I'm coming to this particular issue in terms of trying to understand what this was about. Uh, so, it made me attracted to Jackie Robinson's story, uh, and as a Montrealer, right, if we're going to sort of move in that direction, uh, the fact that Montreal played this very important role uh, in providing for Branch Rickey an opportunity to situate Jackie Robinson, a very courageous player. Right? There are many excellent players. Jackie Robinson is not the only excellent player uh, from the African uh, community, African descent community, at that particular time. But he was a player that Branch Rickey felt. Uh, had the courage to be able to back down in the face of considerable provocation, which he was going to inevitably confront in a country that was very resistant, uh, very resistant to uh, permit the breakthrough on the part of Jackie Robinson, which would fundamentally change the dynamics in terms of civil rights in the United States. And in part, although I don't want to exaggerate this, uh, that breakthrough uh, plays a very, very tiny role in the eventual election of Barack Obama as President of the United States, in, in some way, without sort of minimizing or exaggerating on either end. But Montreal, which did not have this practice of racial segregation, though, let's be careful. Montreal was not a city without racism, it was not a city without anti-Semitism. So as we celebrate the Jackie Robinson story in Montreal, again, we need to be careful not to allow ourselves to think, oh, Montreal was the beacon of freedom, you can come to Montreal, and yes, it was a good place for Jackie Robinson to play. It was a good place for Americans to become adjusted to the fact that, yes, Jackie Robinson was going to play in the majors against all the odds that he had to fight. He eventually would do that. Uh, and Montreal was the gateway where that process began. But let's be careful as young people who are going to be studying history eventually, if you're not already doing so, Montreal was not a place without discrimination. But it was a place where we Welcome Jackie Robinson. I think we'd be very proud of doing that as Montrealers. I think we'd be very proud of our city. Uh, and I yeah. think this is a story that is one that we need to share with as many Montrealers as possible. And I'm glad I'm able to play a very tiny role in doing that. Uh, I was able to publish this book on Jackie Robinson, both in English and French. Uh, there are virtually no copies left of it, and so uh, the absence of doing a reprint in our wonderful technological age, I'm actually going to post it uh, in both versions on the website of my organization, the Association for Canadian Studies. So those of you who are teachers, who are educators, who want to be able to uh, share the story that I've had the opportunity to write with others, please feel free to consult their website, and we can make a link to the City of Côte Luke website so it can be available as well. Alors, permettez-moi aussi de dire quelques mots en français. Mm -hmm. uh, merci encore, Mike. Uh, C'est toujours un plaisir d'avoir eu l'occasion de travailler avec, avec toi. Merci pour cette occasion de, de, de m'asseoir avec le grand Warren Cromarty et Kermit Kidman. Uh, je suis extrêmement content de, que, je, que je suis là pour, pour participer uh, dans cette journée. Et uh, je vous encourage tous à prendre l'occasion de lire l'histoire de Jackie Robinson et comme j'ai mentionné, je vais rendre disponible des copies de livres en anglais et en français sur notre site web. Merci encore, merci infiniment. Hi everybody. How? First of all, tell us about your history in playing professional baseball. I know it was a brief history, and then how you came about meeting Jackie Robinson when that happened. Bye. I originally went to spring training at Bear Mountain Inn when the war was on. We weren't allowed to go south. And it, during the spring training, Jackie Robinson was brought in in his uh, lieutenant's uniform uh, to the newspapers at Bear Mountain Inn to notify the newspapers that he was being signed by the Montreal Royal Baseball team for the year 1946. This was 1945. 
So I, and I didn't meet Jackie Robinson at the time, but he was introduced to the press at Bear Mountain Inn. When I met Jack, Jackie Robinson, it was in spring training of 1946 after I spent a full year of playing for the Montreal Royals in 1945. I had married a Montreal girl, and I uh, ended up taking it on my honeymoon, on our honeymoon to Daytona Beach at spring training. Jackie Robinson had to stay in the black side of town and was driven to the ballpark by a preacher, black preacher every morning at 8.30 in the morning. I took a bungalow on the beach as my honeymoon, and I was afraid of being late at the ballpark, so I used to take a bus to the ballpark every morning real early, and Jackie and I used to spend at least a good hour before the team arrived because we were afraid we'd be late for, for practice. We used to discuss my year at Montreal the year before, and he used to ask me the questions about how it would, he would be taken in Montreal as a black person. That particular year, 1945, we had two black Alouette football players playing for us, and they were loved by the public. I had told him that he wouldn't have a problem at all, and as intelligent as he was, and as the way he spoke, he was a beautiful man, and it was a pleasure to be with him for those 30 days every morning. The next time I saw Jackie Robinson was 10 years later in one of my business trips from Montreal to New York, and I was at a bus station ready to go to the airport and buying a newspaper and a Coke. And somebody in front of me looked, the back of his neck looked like Jackie Robinson. So I, I looked sideways and there was Jackie Robinson. Now I hadn't seen him for 10 years or spoken to him for 10 years. He had already retired and he had lost his son at the time. So I need him, I need him with my knees to say something to him, and he turned around with his fist, ready to hit me. <laughs> when I, he, he looked at me, and I looked at him, and I said, remember me, I had a funny first name. My name was Kermit. He looked at me, and he said, your name was Kermit, and we spent many a days at, Bam, at uh, Daytona Beach together. And we spoke for a while, and we, we left each other and shook hands. That was the last time I saw Jackie, and, and Jackie died a little while later from his sickness. That's my time with Jackie Robinson. That's amazing. Yeah. That's why you were uh, kind of a, a pioneer, because you were actually a Jewish professional baseball player. So. I don't think there were too many Jewish professional baseball players, uh, even even today. 1945, 1945, there weren't any playing in. Uh, Scotty Rosen was playing for Toronto at the time. Not the only other one. He had played in Montreal, and he played for the Brooklyn Dodgers before I came up. All right, I'm going to have uh, more questions, but now I want to turn it over to the man they named the chocolate bar after, the crowbar. <laughs> Warren Cromarty. So, so nice. Before I get started here, I want to thank all the, the kids that come here this morning, being patient enough to hear this, uh, this story. And Kip, I got to tell you, I, I, I started to get a little emotional when you, you talk about Jackie. And I'm getting emotional now. I saw the movie. Um, it was a little bit tough to watch. It's true. Everything is true. Um, my father played in the uh, the Negro League as well. He played for the Indianapolis Clowns. And I was talking to him uh, one morning watching baseball, and I had asked him, I said, what did that happen to the league? Well, you know, we, we played a while and we got this kid. They 
they got from the army. And once they, they signed that kid from the army, the whole, the whole league started to break up. I didn't know he was talking about Jack and Robinson at that time. I was a kid. Because the army, you know. So um, he played in the Negro Leagues along with uh, Buck O'Neill and the rest of the guys. And I did see the movie. We had a premiere maybe a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we were very fortunate enough to get the movie. Uh, very, uh, we were very proud to get the Jackie Robinson story movie. Uh, not bad for a city that doesn't have a team, huh? <laughs> so we got the movie. And I don't know you youngsters in here realize who you have sitting here. You have history here. And you should write a, your teacher should make a better story about this day today. See how much who's listening. Because this is very important for each and every one of you here. And if it wasn't for Jackie Robinson, there is no athlete of color who would be playing any type of sport, period. <coughs> period. And if you get a chance to watch the movie, you'll see what I'm talking about. And it's pretty much only half of what he's been through as far as uh, being successful and all of the stuff that he had to go all these players are getting off the bus, they go inside the restaurant, he has to stay on the bus because he can't go inside the restaurant. Claude Raymond, I don't know if you, some of you folks here know who Claude Raymond is. He uh, used to play for the Expos. Well, he played with uh, a person inside that movie, uh, Charles. Um, his last name, you're gonna see him, and uh, he was telling me about uh, situations that were very tough for uh, Jackie Robinson to play. But um, uh, it was a great movie, and I recommend uh, for you to watch the movie and uh, to take notice about history. And I'm here this morning to represent the Montreal Expos. <laughs> now, I, I know some of you youngsters in here have never, how many of you youngsters in here have seen an Expo game? Okay, so you maybe saw the last game. <laughs> uh, as, you, as I walk around and I, and I see the city itself, Constantly, I see Expo's gear. I see the youngsters wearing the caps, the hoodies, the t-shirts. Not bad for a city that doesn't have a team, huh? I mean, there's something going on here. I mean, the spirit is very, very strong here about baseball since 1969. And I was very fortunate to play on some very good teams and some very good players. Gary Carter, who stayed here in Cote St. Luke. Andre Dawson, the Hall of Fame. Tim Raines, Larry Parrish, all the good teams. But we never won. We came close, but we never could get over that little hump. You know, we're winning a championship. But I am here uh, on a mission, on a journey here in Montreal. I put together a, a, a group to try and bring back Montreal Expos, bring baseball back to Montreal. It's been nine years now since the team has left. And I think that's a little too long for me and for everybody else here associated with the Expos. It's uh, it's a journey. Things are going well with, with that. And I'm looking forward to the time that uh, the parents could take the kids who's never been to an Expo game to watch an Expo game because Montreal Expo is it's history here. It's part of your history. Jackie Robinson enabled us to have a baseball team. The Dodgers and Jackie Robinson, he loved here in Montreal. The family still loves to come here. They have a plaque on an apartment where they used to live. And um, you know, it's all about history. And today, uh, I'm a very small part of the history. He's a real big part of history. Because I, I don't know about you, but I got a big kick out of the story he just told. And uh, I want to share, I want to share uh, just how important uh, baseball is in the world. You know, baseball's got this, this, this knack of, of cutting through troubled times, nervous times. Travesties. For instance, in 911, 9/11, when it happened a few years ago, what sport started the movement back to get people back on track again? It was baseball. When President Bush threw out their first pitch in New York City, the Yankee game, they was going crazy. Baseball has a knack of doing that, and I understand there's a lot. To, to be said about Montreal, and things have changed since eight years ago. Eight years ago, we didn't even have the internet, eight years ago. So 
a lot of things have changed since then, but the attitude has gotten better. And I think really the people of Montreal, the people of Canada, a lot of people in Canada, not just Montreal, all around the world, they really are supporting the cause. Expo's coming back here in Montreal. I hear it all the time. I hear it from the fans. I hear the, the disappointment. I hear the, the eagerness to get it back. So I, I understand the support. I have the support and I feel that support to do that. But it's going to be up to my youngsters, who I call today my, uh, 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 the, 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 the young. I want to reach out to you. I want you to see my face and understand, so, okay, I, I, maybe I didn't see him play, but I got his baseball card. Oh, I heard his dad talking about him. Here I am. And let you see the grassroots. That's the name I want to use. You guys are the grassroots, the youngsters out there, the baseball players out there. You, you know, my, my fellow Expo player over there got his base, Expo cap on over there. He's supporting the cause. See, that's what it's all about. Maybe he, have you seen a baseball game, Expo game? <laughs> you see, there you go. There you go. So um, I am so I'm so proud to be here. Like like Mike just said, I have a baseball school this summer, right over here. My ages are seven to fifteen. We got some stuff to give you after the thing here. Trying to spread the word, teach the game of baseball, fundamental way of having some fun. Maybe we can get another Russell Martin in here or Joey Votto. Another Canadian, uh, just, Justin Mar Marneau. May we have somebody in here? And the last thing at least, I want you guys to follow your dreams. You youngsters out there, follow your dreams. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do anything. Because when I started baseball, it was everything to me. I couldn't wait to get to the park. Hated Sundays because couldn't play baseballs on, on Sundays for some reason or another. So I was hitting rocks and cans and whatever because we couldn't forward the baseballs. And every time we get a little baseball, I would hit it far enough and we would lose it. Had to get one every day. So baseball has been very, very good to me. <laughs> Worldwide, I played in Japan also. I went to Tokyo, Japan for seven years. I speak Japanese. Ohayo gozaimasu, minasama. That means good morning to everybody. Spent <laughs> several years in Japan. And I finished my career with the Kansas City Royals in 1991 with George Brett and Brent Saberhagen and Kirk Gibson and those guys like that. So, but I love my city of Montreal. I love my city of Montreal. And I want to say this, they always ask me, he says, Crow, you know, I have a nickname. My nickname is Crow, without the W. And... Crow, why are you such a love? What is all the fascination of Montreal? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing I remember playing in Quebec City. I started in the minor leagues in Quebec City. And we used to take the bus after a game, 14 hour trips, go to Pittsburgh or Philadelphia. And I used to look at that beautiful city outside my window. I used to look at that, my window. I used to look at that beautiful city. It's all lit up. And I said to myself, oh boy, that city looks great. It looks like it's happening over there. Look at how bright lights it is over there. I can't wait to get over there and play for the Expos. So I got called up to the major leagues uh, in, into the minor league career. Met Gene Mock and everything like that. And Jerry Park. How many Jerry Parkers we have here? Jerry Park. So I guess I'm, I guess I'm loyal. I'm very loyal to this city because I owe everything. This is, this is, this is where it all started for me. And up the road two and a half hours. So. Uh, I am very honored to be here this morning, and I know we have some other things we need to talk about. I just want to introduce myself. I'm so glad that you are here to listen to this story because Jackie Robinson paved the way. He is a hero forever. Forever. And uh, we're going to have little questions and answers after. And, uh, thank you. Thank you, Crow. I, I just, Kermit, I just wanted you to share one other story with the audience. Uh, that was, you told me that when you met Jackie Robinson in Daytona Beach back 67 years ago, that there was only a certain part of town that blacks were allowed to go to. Is that what you said to me? Right. Can, you, can you move forward to the mic? Just explain that to the kids. Well, the blacks were not allowed to walk where, on the right side of the street where the whites walked. And there were water fountains at Daytona Beach, and the blacks weren't able to drink from the water fountains in Daytona Beach. And whenever we got on the bus, the blacks had to sit in the back two rows, not in the front of the bus. 
that was 1946. So it's not too far away. Warren. Um, when you were very, very young, did you ever experience any racism? Have you experienced any racism in your life? Uh, not really, because uh, I've been very fortunate to play, uh, being only black on the team, uh, Spanish teams, Japanese teams, that type of thing. Uh, maybe I ran into something in junior college, some s smart guy on the bench over there trying to make a name for himself, and all he did was added fuel to what I did. I proceeded to hit a grand slam that, <laughs> and I saluted him when I hit him. Life's been life been good, but make, make no doubt about it, no mistake about it. I know it's there. I knew it was always there. And um, what's really saved me and who I am today is baseball. I had too much problem trying to hit that little white baseball with a winner. How many here know how many stitches on a baseball? One. What about the Bialik baseball team? How many stitches on a baseball? No. One. You're gonna, no, I'm going to tell you right now because you sound like Jeopardy out there now. 108. It's 108 stitches. So you just learned something today about a little baseball. I guarantee you, those guys up there making 10, 15, 20 million dollars a year, you ask them how many stitches on the ball, you're making 15 million, how many on there? Uh, uh, 200? No idea. No the sport. Kermit, do you have another comment? I got one incident to tell you about Jackie Robinson. In spring training, an exhibition game at Daytona Beach. Uh, I led off for the Montreal Royals, and Jackie Robinson was batting second. And uh, I had a, hit a single, and he got the bun sign, and I was trying to get to second base. He butted the ball, and Eddie Stanky, at that, that time, was the second baseman for the Brooklyn Dodgers. And the first baseman ran in, fielded the ball, and threw it to Eddie Stanky, covering first base. And as Jackie Robinson crossed first base, he... he tagged him in a wrong spot. <laughs> and Jackie Robinson went down and was hurt at first base. And um, he looked up at Eddie Stanky, who tagged him in the wrong spot, and he didn't say a word. In the dugout, in the, after the game was over in the field house, Eddie Stanky apologized to Jackie Robinson and said that Mr. Ricky put him up to it uh, to test him to see if he would fight. And that's what he had to go through. Amazing stories. I'm going to have one more question that I want to ask, and then I want to see if some students have some questions. Uh, Jack Jedwab, we're hearing all these stories. Um, I, I'm sure, even for someone my age at 50, it's hard to believe that this happened in our lifetime, but what can you say to kids here in elementary school that how it was possible that there was such racism that's this kind of story that Kermit Kidman just told us about buses and parts of town and so on and so forth. How is that possible that even happened? Well, I think uh, you've got to go back to the history of the uh, United States. It, uh, it was a country that practiced slavery uh, for quite an extended period of time. In fact, in many ways, the country was built you know, on, uh, on slavery. Uh, and so it didn't transition easily away from slavery. It was a country where there was, as we know, there was a civil war very polarized country uh, that needed the Civil War basically to uh, unify itself. But in unifying itself, uh, this very important degree of prejudice, which persisted and arose out of the slave movement, of, uh, out of slavery, which slavery, remember, involves the inferiorization of a particular group. Right? The persistent belief uh, of, the, of a significant element of the white population in the United States that black people were inferior. And so even though the slavery movement ended at some point, this idea that blacks were inferior persisted. Uh, and that led to the segregationist practices. It was that, that was the outcome of the slavery movement. Now, it's very hard for us today, it's true, because many of us uh, are brought up and learn that racism is unacceptable. So it's very hard for us to resituate ourselves in that period where racism was legitimate. In fact, it probably wasn't described as racism. It was just described as the way in which people interact with each other and the way it should be because of this idea that there was an inferior group, something that's unacceptable. And let's be careful, uh, as I said earlier, 
uh, as much as uh, many of us have learned that racism is unacceptable. And I strongly encourage everyone here, when they encounter any form of racism against anyone, to be prepared to act, to be prepared to fight against it, because we need to be vigilant about this. Uh, and we need to know as well, what, whatever community we belong to, that I can speak from my own standpoint as a member of the Jewish community, you know, that it's important for me not only, obviously, to act when I see an inc incident of anti-Semitism, but when I see anyone from any other community that's the object of any form of racism, I feel compelled to act. And that's something all of you should do. And that's something that, regrettably, at that particular time, not enough was done. Uh, let me just end on this last point. One of the issues that helped Jackie Robinson make the breakthrough was because Branch Rickey, right, who's then, of course, the uh, president of the, uh, of the Royals, uh, said that if you know, people uh, of, of African descent can fight with our boys, as he said, in Guadalcanal, then why can't they play baseball? So that very same period in our history, which, as Pyramid said, is not that long ago. It's fresh in many people's minds in this room that you know are, are, are Mike's age, or like me, almost Mike's age. <laughs> I just want to say one thing about uh, civil rights. And you students out there, when you do your history, you, you got to know your history, how the civil rights started. Jackie Robinson started the civil rights movement along with Branch Rickey. Then it went to Rosa Park. Then it went to Martin Luther King. Okay, so this is where you learn something about civil rights. Branch Rickey and Jackie Robinson started the civil rights movement at that time. It wasn't Rosa Parks, she didn't move, she didn't get off the bus. She was a part of it. She started, she, she exposed it. Martin Luther King disposed it. So in that order is how the civil rights started in the United States. So <coughs> put that in your history book. Uh, Mayor Housefather, just is one point to add, uh, just related to this conversation. I don't know why I should say this. I mean, Jack inspired me because this is a history lesson for all of us. And part of the reason we have the human rights walkway is to impart Canadian and American history and world history to everyone. So a lot of people believe that judges are infallible, right? You go to the court, you see the judge in the black robe, you see the judge in rendering a decision, and you say, oh my God, that judge. Let's, let, let, he understands or she understands what they're talking about. Slavery, slavery was agreed upon and made legal not only when the United States was founded, but also by the Supreme Court of the United States in the Dred Scott case in the 1850s, which is what led to the Civil War. The US Supreme Court actually required and agreed that if a slave escaped to a free state, he had to be returned to his master. And, and, and the Civil War in the United States started because of a Supreme Court decision, or largely because of a Supreme Court decision. Segregation was exactly the same way. After the Civil War in the United States, Congress, a Reconstructionist Congress, enacted the 14th Amendment that basically said, I think it's the 14th, I'm pretty sure it's the 14th, I don't have it in my head, but I'm pretty sure, that, that said that black men were allowed to vote, that blacks and whites had to be treated equally. And you had a period of 20 or 30 years after the US Civil War, from the 1860s to the 1890s, when black Americans were elected to Congress from many of the southern states. But then, the southern whites decided, how can we counteract the fact that we don't have slavery anymore? And they started segregation, which meant that in railways, black people weren't allowed into the same car as white people, uh, separate drinking fountains, etc. This went to the Supreme Court again in 1896, in a case called Plessy versus Ferguson. And in 1896, again, the US Supreme Court with Justice Harlan dissenting, said that segregation was legal. That it was legal as long as there were the same facilities for blacks and whites, and we all know there were never the same facilities. The white facilities were always better. That it was okay. And it was not until 1954, in Brown versus Board of Education, where, again, part of the, the segregation was black schools. Black children in the South were not allowed into white schools. And that led to a whole generation of, of African Americans that didn't have the same rights to education as the white kids had. And, and, and it wasn't until the 1950s, 1954, think about it, eight years after Jackie Robinson was in Daytona Beach with Kermit, 
that the US Supreme Court said you can't have separate black and white schools. So I only say this because just as the point Jack made, you know, we looked at it at a time and 50 years, 60 years later, we look back and we say, we can't believe that blacks and whites were not allowed into the same schools. This was only when your grandparents were, were, were young kids. This is, this is when your grandparents were alive. Think about that. So today, just as Jack said, when we have other issues that we see being fought for equality of other groups, and I'm going to use gay marriage as an example in the United States, make sure that you are on the right side of history and you fight for other people's rights. Because we don't want to look back 60 years ago and everybody says, oh my god, I can't believe what people were thinking then. And we were on the wrong side of history. Always try to make sure you're on the right side of history. And when you see one of your classmates being bullied or being hurt, or being picked on for any reason, make sure that you stand up and fight for them because that makes you a better person and that's exactly what Jackie Robinson taught us and I think that's the important lesson that all of us can learn today. So thanks, sorry to continue. Do we have a spot there or do we have a spot there? Uh, okay, a couple of questions. Any students have any questions? If you do, put your hand up and just stand up. We have a question from a student. Hey, hey young man. Right here. Okay, who, who has the question? Go, go ahead, speak loud. Were you ever beat up, Robinson? Were you asking? Me? Warren, did you ever meet Jackie Robinson? No, I, 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 must, I must tell you uh, that, that uh, like I said, my father played in the same league, but I never met him. I thought my father was the closest that I've uh, come to meeting Jackie. But he just, he just changed it. Yeah. He just changed He's the closest I've ever come to Jackie Robinson. If I know, if, if I ever meet Rachel Robinson, I'm going to totally lose it. <laughs> I just, I want to kiss her feet. <laughs> I want to talk about you. Right now, he's the closest I've come to. And, and I hear, Warren, you're negotiating with Kermit to be an instructor at your baseball school this summer. Because you're looking for a good 90-year-old uh, instructor at the coach at the uh, party baseball school. Uh, another question. Um, we'll, let, let's see if there's a student first. Okay, go ahead. Break behind. You. Go ahead. Oh, no, I'm not the mayor. No, I'll never be the mayor as long as Anthony Hussman. Was that your question? Okay. When did the Montreal Expo stop as a team, Warren? When was the last game? 2004. Um... September 29th. My birthday, believe it or not. Oh. Hated that day. <laughs> Who invented black history? Good question. Now, maybe Jack Jibwell can answer that question. Who invented black history? Well, I don't think you can identify <laughs> one person inventing black history. There's such a, a, there's such a thing as Black History Month. But, and I would argue that that's an offshoot of the, uh, of course, the uh, Martin Luther King uh, right. era. So. Very good chance. Yeah. Look, let me put it this way. It, it's, it's a long shot. And I'm not a gambler, but I'm going to take a shot on this one here because timing is everything. I think right now the timing is good to explore the possibilities of coming back here. Now, we've had this expo since 1969. Washington's, Washington's had it, what, three times? Uh, Milwaukee's had it twice. Uh, there's a couple other teams out there. So we deserve a second chance like everybody else. So it's going to, it has to come down to you guys and your support that's given to this city. So it's going to come down to a point that the fans are going to have to speak. But yes, we How have. How much longer do you think it's going to take for the expos? <laughs> Good question. How much longer will it take to get the expos back? How uh, long as it takes. <laughs> you know, we don't really have a time limit. We, 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 we sort of, kind of, it's kind of you guys answer, sort of, kind of, huh? <laughs> but, uh, we're working on it. We have a we have a uh, some good momentum going right about now. So they all have to fall into place. Put it this way: you're going to be old enough to see it. You're going to be there. Okay. All right. All right. How did Jackie Robinson die? Do do we? I mean, how did he die? Jack, do we know that Jack Jenwell? How he died? I'm not sure. Kermit, do you know how he passed away? I mean, I think he had uh, was it diabetes? Or? Yeah, diabetes. Diabetes and type two cancer. Yes. Yeah, diabetes to cancer. He started I remember, blind, I think, a little bit. Started to lose his eyesight. Oh, yes, I remember though. You know, as a youngster, watching the Expos play, and Jackie Robinson being a special guest at the old Jerry Park and being interviewed by uh, the Montreal uh, media, so he did come see the Expos play. Okay, uh, another question from the, all the way to the left. You go ahead. Yeah, you go ahead. Would you treat it? Would you treat it differently for being the black person? 
person in the on the baseball team? Warren, were you treated differently as a black person, a uh, baseball player at all? I guess maybe it wasn't a big deal in your time. No, not 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 really. I let my game do the talking. <laughs> All right, another one over here on the left. Do you have a question? Go ahead. Um, Hebrew Academy's got some great questions here. Go ahead. Why did the Brooklyn Dodgers break apart? Why did the Brooklyn Dodgers break apart? Maybe Kermit Kitman can tell us. Why did the Brooklyn Dodgers move to L.A.? What a question. <laughs> Kermit, do you know the answer to that question? Why they moved to L.A.? Just move forward to the microphone. I think that uh, they found, found that Los Angeles is the bigger contendants, and they can make more money in Los Angeles. Go ahead. How many home runs did you hit? Okay, how many home runs did you hit, Warren? I was okay. Um, but the most I've hit during the season was thirteen. Thir thirteen, because I wasn't a power hitter. I let guys like Carter, Dawson, those guys drive me in. I'm the I'm the type of guy that gets on second base and uh, you know get, get everything going. I, I I'm a line drive hitter. That means I go hit from left field, right field, right field, left field. Let me tell you, the crow was a clutch hitter. That's what we call it. What's that about here? Is someone trying to buy, buy back the Expos? In other words, I guess, Warren, where is the money going to come from? Is it going to come as, from as Marvin Gurman in the back? As political as correct is that we're waiting on this feasibility study to find out exactly where we're going to be going and see if it's viable. But yes, we're going to have, uh, we, I have some people with some, some pockets. Where did you get the name Crow? Uh, Cromarty is my last name, C R O, so they just make it short. So like, oh. Which, position did you play? Which position did you play, Warren? I started off in left field, got beat up out there. First time I ever played left field because I'm a first baseman. Then I moved to first base. That's the year we won the pennant in 81. And the day that Rick Monday hit that lousy home run, and we won't talk about that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, a little bit of right field. So I'm an outfield first baseman. Left-hander. Okay, we're gonna have one quick question from Stan Diamond, who is an outstanding left-handed slugger in the Cozy Luke Slopich League. Stan, go ahead, ask your question. Hey. That's not true. When Jackie Robinson played in Montreal, they, Montreal Royals won the Little World Series. And that was something you don't have anymore. And the story has always been repeated that Jackie Robinson said it was the first time he had been chased out of love instead of hate. Yes. <laughs> That's a good one, Stan. Thank you. We're gonna we're gonna have a concluding remarks from Councilor D. By the way, I just wanted. We were we welcoming Warren Cromartie's baseball school to Coatesville, but we're also welcoming something also very exciting to Coatesville this summer. Yay Yogurt is coming here, and Mark Kerbin, the owner, is in the back. Mark, give a wave to everybody. And Yay Yogurt, by the way, is kosher. It is kosher, so uh, they're opening at the Cavendish Mall, known as the Cartier, in June, right, Mark? You know, I, I taught high school here in Coatesville and around for some 35 years, mostly at Wager. And, you know, I always encourage my students to go beyond, you know, the lectures and the textbooks and to deal with the important things in life. And, you know, autobiographies, biographies, movies, like the one you said about Jackie Robinson, this imparts history and it expands your vision of what the world is really like. You know, some people talk about putting your money where your mouth is. I'm very proud of my mayor this morning. He came up here and he gave you uh, a Devar Torah on a little bit of things that are very important. You know, rights, bills of rights, they're words on paper. If you don't, if you use a Jackie Robinson expression, if you don't come to the plate and defend them. Um, what happens out there? What happens out there when something is wrong and you feel it's wrong? You do like the mayor did. You read about it. You study it. You make sure that you know what you're talking about. And then, if it's still in your heart of hearts that something's wrong, you come to the plate and you speak about it. And our mayor went to, New, uh, to um, Quebec City. He spoke about Bill 14 because he felt that this is an injustice. We have to speak about it. everybody else who did it.
this venue is so important for you because you realize there are bad things that happen. There are judges who feel that that is the option of the day and you, by speaking out, can change these. So I'm very happy you're all here today. I hope you take something back with you and realize that things can change. Injustice is only a matter of coming to the plate, speaking out and going to bat, like Jackie Robinson would say, for what you feel in your heart of hearts is right. Thank you very much.